This is a podcast on pulse oximetry. As you know, pulse oximetry estimates the hemoglobin saturation from the differential absorption of red and infrared light. This graph shows the relationship between light absorption of oxygenated hemoglobin and non-oxygenated hemoglobin at red and at infrared, and the ability to separate those two, to distinguish those two, is what characterizes the ability of the pulse oximeter to work. Conventional pulse oximeters compute the ratio between reduced hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin based on these two signals. The fractional saturation is the ratio of oxyhemoglobin to the sum of all hemoglobin, and that includes those which cannot bind oxygen. Pulse is an integral part of pulse oximetry. The pulse is determined by the change in light caused by flow of arterial blood. So light is pulsed on and off hundreds of times per second, and a peak and trough of each arterial pulse wave is dis determined. The trough represents the tissue, capillary, blood, and venous blood, and the peak represents all of that plus that blood which was added as a result of the arterial pulse. So what happens then is that the arterial pulse is calculated by subtracting the trough values from the peak values, and that is the mechanism for determining what is believed to be arterial oxygen saturation although it's reported out as pulse oximetry. There are two different types of pulse oximetry, transmission and reflectance. Transmission, in transmission pulse oximetry, the light is transmitted through the tissue and detected on the other side. That's the form that we use most commonly when we're doing, when we're putting a probe on the finger. Reflectance oximetry detects light reflected back from the tissue, and it's caused by lack of homogeneity of the tissue. Reflectance pulse oximetry has some major limitations. You've got to eliminate extraneous light, and the signals are weaker. If you place the probe over a vein or an artery, you may get a spuriously low value. And vasoconstriction causes overestimation of the pulse oximetry saturation. There are several standards that manufacturers of pulse oximeters are held to. The limit, there's supposed to be a limit of duration of operation at temperatures greater than 41 degrees centigrade, centigrade. The manufacturer is supposed to state the accuracy of the device between 70% and 100% saturation. They, if the manufacturer claims accuracy during motion or low perfusion states, there's supposed to be a description of the testing methods used. There's supposed to be an indication if the data are not current, an indication of signal inadequacy, and an alarm for a saturation of less than 85%. The audible alarm is supposed to follow the saturation, that is, the, the uh, much feared decrease beep, 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 beep as the, the uh, oxygen saturation falls. Obviously the finger's the most common sight. It has a low failure rate and higher accuracy than the earlobe, but is sensitive to perfusion. You can improve the detection by doing things that improve perfusion, such as a dis digital nerve block or administration of a vasodilator or simply rubbing the finger. The pulse oximetry value decreases if the arm is raised or lowered. It may be um, compromised by the presence of dark nail polish or acrylic nails. One way to try to defeat that is to orient the probe to transmit side to side to the finger rather than top to bottom or from nail bed to fingertip. Because the sampling site is peripheral, the detection of change in oxygen saturation is lower, sorry, slower.
The accuracy has been shown to be not affected by the presence of an A-line or a burn. Although local hypothermia may compromise function if it's on the same side as the IV. Think about that for a minute in terms of what we're currently doing to try to make sure that the blood pressure cuff doesn't compromise either the pulse oximeter or the IV. With regard to the toe, it too is peripheral. It takes reportedly up to one to two minutes longer to show a change in oxygen saturation than if you're monitoring on a finger. Interestingly, if the, an epidural is present, it may increase the reliability. And in fact, some people have reported that the increased amplitude of the plethysmograph may be an indicator of a successful epidural block. The nose responds more rapidly to changes in saturation than probes on the extremities, but the accuracy is controversial. Things that are, say that it's good or conditions in which it's supposed to be better are hypothermia, hypotension, and the administration of vasoconstrictors. But you have a higher failure rate, and specifically, you have spuriously low values in the Trendelenburg position due to venous congestion. Basically, the pulse oximeter gets confused with the additional blood that's there in the tissues and the veins. The ear is particularly useful as a monitoring site. If the finger motion is pre present, it works better if you massage the ear for 30 seconds with either alcohol or a vasodilator. Some people have reported applying amla cream to get an improved signal quality. Compared to the finger probe, the response time is faster, and it may perform better in patients who have hypoperfusion or are receiving vasoconstrictors. But it may give more erroneous readings in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. I can see that as a question on the exam. It's also more likely to be erroneous in Trendelenburg position, as we indicated earlier. Understand that the amplitude of the plethysmograph responds primarily to changes in pulse pressure. The tongue, uh, it's a transmission, primarily a transmission probe, as you wrap it around the tongue in the sagittal plane, although some reflectance probes have been used, and they suffer from the same limitations as all reflectance probes. The mouth should be closed. It's got a faster response time than on the extremities. It's more resistant to bovi interference than the finger or toe. But tongue quivering may mimic tachycardia. It should be positioned after intubation so you don't dislodge it. It may be difficult to maintain in place during emergence, and excess oral secretions may present a problem. There are specific probes available from manufacturers for monitoring pulse oximetry at the cheek. They tend to be more accurate than finger probes if you can actually get them to work. They have a faster response time. They're more effective in circumstances of hypothermia, decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, and low pulse pressure. But they're difficult to place. They have poor acceptance by awake patients, and manipulation of the airway can result in artifacts. The esophagus has been used for pulse oximetry. That is a reflectance oximeter probe that's used there. As you expect, it's got a faster response time than probes on the, the extremities. But really, to all intents and purposes, probably because of the last two features, problems with placement and obtaining a reliable signal, esophageal pulse oximetry really isn't used much at all. The forehead is another site. It uses reflectance pulse oximetry, so remember that it, for the limitations and problems associated with that. The manufacturers generally recommend that it be positioned above the eyebrow, centered slightly lateral to the iris. Some people have a headband that they put on to try to apply pressure in an attempt to improve the signal. The forehead is less affected than the ear or the finger by hypothermia or poor perfusion. It's got a faster response time. But pooling of venous blood due to compromised venous return 
may produce low saturations. As a result of that, some people say that it should not be used in Trendelenburg. In any site, a malposition probe may cause falsely high or falsely low values. Sometimes probes can be completely dislodged and still report a signal. I walked into an operating room, an empty operating room one time, and the pulse oximeter was showing a saturation of 80%. There was no patient in the room. There was no nobody had connected to the pulse oximeter. It was simply sitting on the bed. It, it was a pediatric probe, and it was reporting a, a saturation of 75%. The appearance of a satisfactory waveform is supposedly an indication that the readings are reliable. Another thing that's supposed to be helpful is if the heart rate based on the pulse ox and the EKG are similar, the saturations are supposedly reliable. Pulse oximetry is used for several things other than just determining the patient's oxygen saturation during anesthesia. It's used to control the lowest oxygen flow rate to decrease the risk of a fire, for example, during laser surgery of the airway, to avoid hyperoxia in neonates, to locate arteries, and to evaluate pulmonary blood flow in children with cyanotic congenital heart disease. Some people have used it to monitor peripheral circulation, although the reliability of that is questionable. It's clearly used, or it has been reported to show, decreased perfusion of the lower extremities when the patients are in lithotomy, especially in Steve Trendelenburg. It's been used to check for brachial artery compression during shoulder surgery, and it's a guide to blood flow distal to the fracture, but it is not useful to detect compartment syndrome because decreased arterial pressure is a late finding in compartment syndrome. It's used to detect brachiocephalic artery compression during mediastinoscopy or to evaluate the effect of a sympathetic block in the pain clinic or other places. The others are pretty much straightforward. When you think about waveforms in a pulse oximeter, you have to understand that most of the current pulse oximeters have an auto gain feature in them. For the comments that follow, this auto gain feature must be turned off. The signal amplitude is proportionate to vascular distensibility. I'll say that again. The signal amplitude is proportionate to vascular distensibility. I see that as a question on the test. The dichrotic notch descends with vasodilation and becomes obscured with vasoconstriction. The advantages of pulse, pulse oximetry, the difference between the measured pulse oximeter and the measured saturation is clinically insignificant at saturations greater than 70%. It's not affected by anesthetic gases. I see that as a question on the test. Obviously, you know that it's got a fast response time. It's non-invasive, and it has, provides continuous measurements. It's convenient. The audible signal provides information without requiring visual assess assessment. You can use it uh, in a battery-operated mode, and it doesn't require heating. There are several factors that have been associated with failure. These are the things that I think are most likely to appear on the test. Extremes of age, hypothermia, hypotension, hypertension, chronic renal failure, anemia, and motion is probably not going to appear on the test. That should be in bright blue because that's clinically relevant, but you already know that motion is a problem. Be careful because the response of some of the pulse oximeters vary. If you end up with no signal, some will display double zero, some will simply display a blank screen or a line, some will display low quality signal, some will display inadequate signal, but frighteningly, one of the problems is that some will cause a freeze in the display. So you were looking at a saturation 93%, the pulse oximeter stops working, but it continues to display 93%. It's got poor function with poor perfusion. It's of marginal use 
at, with a high arterial partial pressure of oxygen. It provides erratic performance with dys dysrhythmias and with a balloon pump. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. The pulse oximeter may respond to a weak or noisy signal by holding on to the old value. That's a significant problem if you don't know that that's what's happening. You can end up with a significant problem because you think the patient's oxygenated adequately and in fact the problem is that the pulse oximeter simply quit, quit working. Most pulse oximeters are designed to defect, detect only two forms of hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin and reduced hemoglobin. Other forms of hemoglobin may confuse the oximeter. Let's talk about some of those aberrant hemoglobin forms. Methemoglobin is normally less than 1%. It absorbs light equally at the wavelengths used in most pulse oximeters. Therefore, it effectively defaults to a saturation of 85%. That means that it's going to give falsely low readings at saturations, real saturations greater than 85%, and falsely high readings at saturations less than 85%. Amylocreme and lidocaine are other drugs that cause methemoglobinemia. To establish the diagnosis of methemoglobinemia, you have to measure the methemoglobin using cooximetry, or at least you used to, because at least one company, pulse oximeter company, is manufacturing a device which is uh, capable of measuring methemoglobin concentrations. Why, you ask, do we not use that? Because the probes are about $85 a piece. They can be reused, but assuming they don't get thrown away, but only for three to five uses, so the expense is substantial. Carboxyhemoglobin has an absorption spectrum similar to oxyhemoglobin. So as you'd anticipate based on that, most pulse oximeters inter interpret carboxyhemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin, and therefore the saturation is reported as spuriously high by the percentage of the carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin may occur during laser surgery, but that's really not clinically relevant in most circumstances. Fetal hemoglobin, the most important part to take away, point to take away from that is that it's really not clinically relevant. Hemoglobin S, controversial what the effects are. Sulfhemoglobin, causes a spuriously low value. There are some aberrant forms of hemoglobin that cause spuriously low or spuriously high values. Again, I don't think any of that would show up on the quiz, and I doubt that you'd ever see any of those things clinically. Other causes of inaccuracy. Be aware of the fact that hyperbilirubinemia does not interfere with pulse oximetry. You're aware of the fact that low, the accuracy is decreased at low saturation. It's more of a problem in patients with dark skin. And severe anemia, although accurate for normal values, may overestimate saturation at low values. Malposition probes, the response varies with the manufacturer. We always talked, already talked about that. Venous pulsations. The pulse oximeter assumes that all pulsatile flow is due to arterial blood flow. So prominent venous pulsations will confuse the oximeter. It will think that that's an arterial pressure wave that it's seeing. It may be worse if probes are placed on the head. So venous pulsations can occur from high peak airway pressures, which cause phasic venous congestion, or may cause it, or low systemic vascular resistance, because the oximeter may sense the pulsatile venous flow and report a spuriously low value. Skin pigmentation, early studies reported that it produced spuriously high values, but recent values, recent studies show no difference in accuracy. Dyes may produce a reported decrease in saturation without an actual change in the real saturation. They can produce their effects whether they're given IV, intraarterially, intradermally, into lymphatics, or in the uterus. Here's a list of dyes that cause this problem. I would expect to see some of these in one way, shape, or form or the other on the exam. 
fingerprinting ink and henna may also produce spuriously low values. For those pediatric anesthesiologists out there, blue finger paint may also do the same thing. Optical interference also can cause inaccuracy. You're aware of the problems with light sources from various different lights. One of the clues may be the inconsistency between the pulse rate on the oximeter and the EKG, or the inability of the pulse oximeter to track the pulse. The susceptibility varies between the manufacturers. You can minimize the effect by something as simple as putting a blue towel or uh, an alcohol wipe packet over the finger in an attempt to shield the probe from ambient light. Nail polish. The keys there are brown, black, blue, and green, but not red or purple. Okay, They may cause spuriously low readings. Synthetic nails may also interfere. Dried blood on the finger may cause spuriously low readings because obviously it's not oxygenated. Electrical interference generally causes an incorrect pulse count. It's more of a problem if the pulse signal is weak. Some monitors display a notice if the interference occurs. Some freeze the display. Things to do to try to minimize this problem are to locate the ground pad as close to the surgical field as possible and locate the probe, the pulse oximeter probe, as far from the surgical field as possible. Also, don't plug the bovi and the pulse oximeter into the same uh, circuit. Motion artifacts. The pulse oximeter can't differentiate motion from arterial pulsations, so it can produce either spuriously high or spuriously low values. There are some specific medical conditions or monitoring conditions that may produce this. You need to be aware of those. Complications. You know about the corneal abrasions because the patients rub their eyes. There are uh, problems potentially with ischemic injuries because of too tight an application of the probe. The thing that's probably most important here is that if you use a pulse oximeter in the MRI and you loop the cables during the MRI, that in and of itself can cause a burn. And that's the end of this podcast on pulse oximetry. Thank you.